you can mute that. Okay, so hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Sarah Franklin. I'm the director of LGBTQ at CAM. And I'm really pleased to see all of you here at the fourth and sadly final panel of the Queer Times Conference. It's been an incredible pleasure to host this very special event all week, um, which is designed to celebrate the first three years of Q Plus here at Cambridge, including all of the ways this program has been um, a powerful influence within the university and also beyond the university as well. Um, it's been a feast of ideas, discussion, imagery, um, and despite not being in person, um, it has felt very much that we're all in the same room. Um, these um, panels have all been recorded. They're all being posted. You can find more information about all of them on the website, the Q Plus website, where you can also sign up for the newsletter and you can find the links to all our social media, um, including our YouTube channel, um, where there's a number of other events that we've done that you can have a look at if you haven't been there already or indeed been in them yourselves. So thank you very much for everyone for being with us today. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, we were really thrilled when all our speakers agreed to give their talks online. And um, I want to give a particularly big thanks to Joe Cotton and to Lucian Stevenson who have been our tech support and organizers all week and have done an absolutely brilliant job of making everyone feel as comfortable as possible um, in, the, in the cloud. Um, so today's panel on queer temporalities is organized and chaired by Dr. Jeff McGuire, who's one of the founder members of Q+. Um, this panel will be followed by an online after party for anyone who would like a chance to socialize and debrief afterwards for about an hour or less, if you wanna just drop in briefly. And if you'd like to stay for this, um, it won't be live streamed and recorded. Okay, so I will now turn to Jeff to introduce our topic and our speakers. And following the panel, we'll have time for Q&A. Um, which you can participate in either by typing a question directly into chat, which you can do during any of the papers. So there'll be three papers in a row. So if you wanna start typing in questions at the beginning, that's fine because we'll wait until all three papers have been given to answer them. And at that point, we will go to the chat to um, take questions from there. And you're also very welcome to raise your hand. That would be your Zoom hand. Um, to um, give a, a question in person as well, which is fine. Okay, so thank you very, very much. And without further ado, over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and thanks to, to everyone for coming along today. I can see some, some really familiar faces and names on screen and, and, and lots of new ones too, which is, which is brilliant. Um, and you know, as Sarah said, I do hope you'll all keep an eye out for Q plus events by, by checking the website and, and by signing up to the mailing list. Um, so I, I know that, that, that many of you have, have attended quite a few of the panels this week and, and some of you have attended all of them. And I think if you have, then th th you'll probably have realized that although today's panel is uh, about queer temporalities, I think we've really been talking about queer temporality in one way or another, um, implicitly or explicitly for the whole week, really. Um, Campbell's... Uh, Campbell's incredible keynote on, on Monday about queer collaboration and um, black joy was centered, I think, on the idea of, uh, of gaps in the archive, and in his case, the, the, the filmic archive. Um, and Campbell urged us really not to, not to go back in, in, in time to, to kind of desperately try and fill those gaps, but really in a sense to, um, to, to, to revel in them as, as spaces and as temporalities that are filled with queer possibility uh, and potential. And in that sense, to kind of, um, to reactivate a sense of queerness where it's historically been erased or invisibilized or policed. Um, then on Tuesday in the Queering Institutions panel, um, Lola reminded us with, with a really 
a brilliant a, a brilliant phrase that I imagine a, a lot of us will use time and time again it, it, when she said that messing with order is what queers do best. Um, and Luna spoke about how the reading group, the, the picket line, the, the moments of the strike all provide ways to, to disorder um, and to queer what, what she called the hegemonic clock time of the neoliberal institutions that we all work and that we study in. And then yesterday in the Queer Methods panel, um, Nisha gave a really, uh, a really rich and, and, uh, and wonderful reading of ghosts and um, haunting in Irish Gothic fiction. Uh, and she paid very close attention to how skidding through time, how appearing out of sync, uh, and how feeling like we've lost all sense of time can, can offer access to alternative ways through fiction of, um, of knowing and being that again, queer notions of the chrononormative and the heteronormative. So overall then, I think um, this week, we've really been kind of figuring the, the archival gap, the, the moment of the picket line, the waiting while institutional structures change, the haunting of ghosts, all as uh, queer temporal constructions that possess the potential to challenge normative scripts um, and those scripts that are assigned to us or imposed upon us. And I think uh, this was really beautifully summed up in Vera's talk on Tuesday um, when she asked us to dare to think with the utopic in mind. Uh, and I, and I, I think and I hope that's precisely what runs throughout the, the three papers that we have lined up for you today. So um, I shall introduce the speakers separately before their papers, um, uh, but just to repeat what Sarah's already said, um, you know, do feel free to use the chat box at the bottom um, to, to, to ask a question or to, to offer a comment, uh, and we'll come to those at the Q&A at the end. Um, Great. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> um, okay, well, our next speaker is uh, Juliana de Martini Rito, who is a PhD student here in Cambridge at the Centre for Gender Studies. Um, Juliana's research explores how Brazilian cultural production provides alternative lenses to interpret the topic of queer temporality. Uh, and Juliana does this by bridging social theory and queer theory to analyze performance art and, uh, sorry, to analyze performance, comma, art and activism. So Juliana, um, over to you. Um, let me just share my screen very quickly. Uh, all right. Can you hear me well? I think so, right? Okay. So thank you for the introduction. And um, I just want to say very quickly that it's so gratifying to share this time with two people whose work I admire so much, Natasha and Sarah. Um, so what I'll be talking today makes part of what Jeff was just talking about, which is my PhD research, um, which is on queer Brazilian alternative forms of reading and feeling time. Um, and to set the tone for this presentation, I would like to start with an excerpt. The passage was taken from the artist Elio Chisica's personal journal, and it says, after Whitechapel, my first and last experience there, after Paris with Cejas Franco, working on Jean Clay's Hobo, after Los Angeles with Ligia Clark, whose communication revived and magnified through her contact with the Americans, after New York with Hubens Gashman, whose work matures each day more, I am again in London. I have no place in the world. So in his 2009 book, Cruising Utopia, Jose Esteban Muñoz poses, how does one stage utopia? The evocation of utopia is not merely a temporal phenomenon, like a face, but also a spatial one in his words, allows the author to situate in queer performances mediated by the symbol of the stage, the potential for alternative possibilities. For Muñoz, Utopia cannot be read as a temporal stage, like an endpoint, where Utopia's mission is to critique what is missing in the present. And so far as queerness induced scripted versions of the future and political aspirations for totality, um, something that I think we all have been talking about through all this conference in so many different and vibrant ways, and Natasha just talked about that as well. Um, queerness is intrinsically tied to Utopia as both become available as a doing and a being that is in the process, unfinished. So with these considerations, I was moved to think in my dissertation with the help of Munoz about how the spatiality of utopia takes resonance with the incommensurability of queer, queer work in Brazil during its 1964 to 1985 di military dictatorship, whose institutionalization of homophobia 
attempted to forestall plural visions of the future, which we'll talk about in a second. This is present in the context of experimental artist, poet, performer, amongst so many other things, and Luchisica's life captured in the passage where he describes his self-exiled travels across Europe and North America during the late 1960s and early 70s as an attempt to produce art without sanctions and censorship. So I was compelled to ask, um, what emerges when utopia cannot be staged where such hope is desired? So here I'm gonna focus on how there might exist queer utopian spaces that attend to contexts beyond one's location. And also, as I'll try to make evident, rather than the propagation and enactment of queer works existing as suppressed at that time, I think that the reproducibility of queerness gets deployed as a site of transformative potential and reproducible of new attachments. I'll try to show that tropicalist art not only demands that we stay open for new meanings and identifications, but Uchisika provides an aesthetic vocabulary to visualize, map, stage, and finally queer utopia. Okay, so in 1960s and 70s Brazil, young artists emerging from the rising and rebellious currents in Brazil's cultural scene adapted to the new artistic and social challenges by creatively articulating their critiques of the present and visions of the future. Perhaps no other movement um, in Brazil faced regime attempts to heterosexualize art more acutely than them, whose growing influence appeared under the name of Tropicalia, as well as this bungi and marginal culture um, that you might have heard through Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gil, the two in the middle right here. Um, Oiticica was a edifying figure here in the rise of the youth movements, one of his early visual installations becoming the name of Tropicalia itself. As the military regime saw this rebellion as not only culturally repugnant, but also politically subversive, these artists' sexuality became a national concern, turning them into a metonym for sexual devancy. So as state investments on political and sexual homogenization, as intrinsic to the Brazilian experience and to its project of the future, also served to justify the exile of several members of Tropicalia, including Caetano and Gil, um, who were portrayed as against Brazil's cultural values, new experiments with both local and international dominant culture arose for Ochisica. Self-exiling the Northern Hemisphere, Ochisica dialogued with the displaced temporal and spatial dimensions of queerness through installations on the ground, but in direct contact with the body. This is particularly evident in Eden, which was exhibited in 1969 at the London Whitechapel Gallery. The installation, also known as the Whitechapel uh, Experiment, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, was a sensory experience composed of open and enclosed spaces across the gallery. The contraposing textures of sandboxes and pools of water stood near enclosed areas similar to puxadinhos, house annexes, and multicolored tents. The viewer is compelled here to participate in these spaces, such as by removing their shoes, relaxing the tents, or laying in nests of straws. Christopher Dunn writes that Eden effectively domesticized public space by offering an inviting environment where people could relax for extended periods of time. This particular consideration of domesticity really caught my attention when I read that. Um, as I think it allows us to expand on the artist's mining of the domestic and or as the national landscape through meditations on queer, queer temporality and utopia. One way of reading the use of domesticity here is through focusing on his art as experimental, as it induces the participants to reinvent and reimagine such a space. Many queer authors have described seemingly homogenous ideas of domesticity as contributing to a vision of time as seamless, unified, and forward moving, to quote Elizabeth Freeman through heterosexual familial arrangements. Photographs of the exhibition capture English families, for example, playing with different materials, laying the nests and entering the labyrinth-like spaces. And if you Google um, the exhibit, you can find so many more images I just couldn't put in my slides here. Um, as such, the intimate and everyday landscape of domestic life becomes a site of experimentation and transformation. As families occupy and interact with the experimentalist exhibition they participate in the continuous construction of Eden, which I believe would not be unreasonable to describe here as a mythic site of heterosexual fantasy of origin and paradise. As the saturated representation of heteronormative utopian paradise loses its symbolic totality, constructions of the family structures, sexuality, 
and sociability become open for new possibilities. Through the play between intimate and public spaces, therefore, the installation provides lenses to read domestic arrangements queerly. But more interestingly for me, though, is how dominant notions of domesticity are also connected to the long-standing colonial endeavor to domesticate populations through violence and control. Queer diasporic discourse has considered on multiple fronts the language of temporality and belongingness, mechanisms to socially displace diasporic, diasporic individuals and reduce them to pre, a pre-modern status in need of catching up with history and the project of modernity, including here exiled and self-exiled individuals such as Ochisika. The monitoring and control of domestic behavior appear, for instance, in the expectation to show assimilation and gratitude to the host country, described by Sarah Ahmed in Cultural Politics of um, Emotion, and follow heteronormative male essentialist readings, renderings of one's nationality explored in depth by Gayatri Gopinath. The tropical tropes of origin and paradise evoked by the queer experimental practice of Eden, I believe, disrupt such conventional good life fantasies, to quote Lauren Berlant, implicit in liberal, homonationalist, and normative discourse of no northern countries. As I see, these tropes are present in the illusion of England as a space of artistic and sexual freedom, but also in tourism initiatives by the Brazilian government in the 1970s that exploited on the image of Brazil as a diverse and harmonious nation. But Eden makes it explicit that while the Brazilian nation ceases to exert a pull on the sexual subject, now imagine in a context where it can be actualized, the pull is not really conditioned by England or Whitechapel Gallery. The temporal and spatial dissonance of the artwork extends to Londoners not to stage utopian possibilities in the North, as it also refuses to be uprooted from Brazil. For instance, in a part of the exhibition if that particularly attracts me, if it's not the most attractive one for me, um, is the participants' bodily contact with the sand. The sand, whose form is built on the pl plurality of grains, clearly gives way and engulfs the feet unearthing queer senses beyond the indivisibility of the body and in haptic attunement with foreign lands and sensations. If modern colonial thought is based on intervening the world and intervening in time, here it feels that we're moving with the world and with time to regenerate another way of affecting and relating to others. As such, Eden challenges domesticity, both in terms of national and heteronormative conventions, while offering space to analyses of the body that may also include non-human oriented forms of relation, a direction which I hope to extend my research in the future. The staging of Eden as a site of trans-regional imaginations of the future, where the here and now is transcended by a then and there that could be, and indeed should be, to quote Moines once again, I believe demonstrates how a queer approach may serve as a strategy of challenging the heteronormative and Northern ex experiences, but also building new affiliations against the process of assimilation. So just to conclude, I briefly try to show um, how Otisika's installation offer a window into the tropicalist possibility of staging utopia, even when it cannot be actualized where it, it is desired. To stage utopia in the sense, as I read, means that tropicalist aesthetic practices figured in this presentation through Eden, as I lack, lack time to describe so many others, open a window into alternative horizons for a global South queers in multiple geographic locations. Ortizica's queer experiments with the land and the future allow us to locate different imaginings of queer sociality that trouble and reject conventions of assimilation and inclusion outside um, the country, and as well articulations of Brazil's heterosexual horizon, something that we must consider as we deal with the ultra-right president Jair Bolsonaro, who attempts in so many ways to obliterate queer futures, such as through the call for a gay cure and stating, and stating that he prefers a dead son to a gay one. And I should extend that the um, pandemic in Brazil has made it even more evident that Bolsonaro's disgust is not exclusive to one group, but to all Brazilians except for his own, for his own life. Um, so even though I can make a point about queerness here, it should be addressed that his disregard not to say anything worse is much wider than that. I think that this artwork in turn refines the connection of transnationality and queer solidarity and as we continue to face international fascist currents and invite us to read art at times of dress in queer, utopian, and restorative ways. Thank you. Thanks, Rihanna. Um, thank you very much.
Um, okay, so our, yeah, our third and final speaker, um, I think, is uh, very well known to everyone here. Um, and, um, you know, th this week, I think we've, we've described lots of people as, as, as founding members of Q Plus and key collaborators of, of Q Plus. Um, but of course, uh, nothing the program has done or is doing or will do um, would have been possible without uh, Sarah, um, and without all of the, the, the immense work, the, the, the generosity, the good humor, and um, I think the genuine commitment that, that Sarah has, has shown as director of uh, the Q Plus program. Um, and uh, I know that there are many of us in this, in this particular Zoom room who are uh, exceedingly grateful to Sarah for her, um, for her guidance uh, and for the immense efforts that she's, she's made to, um, to enact change, um, meaningful, sustained change across Cambridge. Um, so I am delighted to introduce her talk on queer DNA and uh, Sarah, I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that really lovely introduction. And thank you also for um, the um, beautiful papers um, in this panel so far. Um, so I hope this will um, complement them. I'm just gonna see if, is my screen showing? Um, all right, here it is, yep. Um, so I, I'm trying to share my screen, here we go. Um, so there we have it, I think. And um, let's go to slideshow and get it to, um, it's done. <laughs> oh, you'd think I'd done this a few times. Okay, so um, I want to talk today a little bit about an area I work in um, on biology, changing definitions of the biological, what their cultural implications are. And um, in the abstract for this, I wrote a little bit about queer temporality and the time of DNA. And of course, there's much more um, than that I could say about this that I'm um, not gonna be able to um, go into in much depth today. Um, and the abstract um, from the program sets out some of those themes. And I am hoping to write a book on queer biology in which I would develop um, these themes more extensively, but for today, I just want to do a very quick overview of why I think um, the concept of queer DNA might be quite a helpful um, umbrella category for some wider changes that have taken place in understandings of the biological and why that affects social formation, not only conceptually, but very um, practically. So um, paternity, um, if you're a social scientist, um, is one of the most important um, questions around which early social theory is built. Um, and as Durkheim, Malinowski, as well as Engels and Morgan have constantly reminded us, um, ignorance or knowledge of physical paternity are considered pivotal to the um, transitions in the evolution of social structure that are outlined in all the 19th century texts um, describing what Claude Lévi-Strauss described as the transition from nature to culture. And according to Lévi-Strauss and to many of the earliest social theorists in anthropology and sociology, as well as other human sciences, all of social life turns on this axis, knowledge of paternity and the law of exogamy um, are the foundational social axioms and um, precipitate what's known as the exchange of women, which Levi Strauss famously described as the most valuable good, therefore also instantiating early economy as well as society. So by the law of exogamy is essentially meant um, control of reproduction, um, which for Lévi-Strauss, as for Marx and Weber, as well as Simone de Beauvoir, 
also signified the transformation of binary gender into hierarchical social status and marriage into a contractual relationship of property. And sexual reproduction, biological reproduction, sexual reproduction has never been very easy to extract from this historical matrix, um, either in social theory or in social life. And neither Foucault nor de Beauvoir ever managed to get beyond the reach of what Foucault described as the birth of the modern biological fact. Um, de Beauvoir and Foucault, both of whom were strongly influenced by Lévi-Strauss and read his book when it first came out in France, um, were very strongly influenced by Lévi-Strauss's contention that exogamy is to the organization of society what grammar is to the organization of language. And each of them, de Beauvoir and Foucault, dedicated much of their early research and significant parts of their first books to understanding the way in which modern biological science both naturalizes and normalizes social structure and what we might call the structure of structure and what we might call the conceptual structure of social structure, um, such as um, um, conjugality, kinship, um, and, and the family. So much of their work, de Beauvoir and Foucault, documents the transformation of marriage, family, kinship, sex, gender, and race into what we might call inherently stratified biological entities, biological entities that are inherently part of stratified social structures and that undergird the inevitability of those structures, such as male and female, kin and non-kin, primitive and modern, or fit and unfit, since of course these ideas are also very influenced by evolutionary biology. So, um, uh, so Gail Rubin, who was part of a generation of feminist anthropologists who challenged the claim that the traffic in women was both culturally primordial and biologically in inevitable, diagnosed what she called the sex gender system through which emotions and subjectivities were manufactured by the same machinery that constructed binary sex, sexual reproduction, sexual difference, and sexual subjectivity. Um, and interestingly, one of the lesser known but arguably increasingly significant passages in Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, which builds very much on Rubin's argument in the 1990s, concerns the alleged discovery of the so-called master switch responsible for sex determination in early mammalian development. And this is an area of reproductive and developmental biology that has been carefully studied for decades in a range of mammals and continues to yield quite fascinating and curious dimensions of the relationship between formative genetic pathways and the development of the gametes that determine sex. So this is really the study of the determination of sex determination. And these gametes are themselves the products of a series of com complex and contingent intersections over time in the process of early development in which timing plays a critical role. Indeed, the so-called critical periods of development are the only times when certain changes can take place. And if they don't play take place during those temporal windows, they won't take place at all. So much research on sex determination in mammals has taken place in the context of studying the wide and varied, unusually varied spectrum of human chromosomal compositions, um, according to which the biogenetics of sex and or gender inevitably appear as a continuum or a heterodox milieu rather than a simple binary pair. And hum humans have lots of different chromosomal arrangements as I'm sure everyone knows. Um, and, um, and, and in a longer talk, it would, be, it would be able to go into the fascinating ways the current effort to replicate gametogenesis in vitro um, is shedding light on this process. And this 
um, was actually the, um, someone's knocking on the door, of course. Um, this was actually the subject of a um, symposium held here at Cambridge recently, um, which is called Synthetic Gametes, but it's actually about the effort to replicate the process of making gametes in vitro. Um, so Butler in Gender Trouble pointed to the irony that key research breakthroughs in the field of human sex determination were made using samples from individuals who were non-binary. That is to say, who had neither X nor XY chromosomes um, determining their sex. And she used this observation, Butler, um, to as part of her signature argument that, um, that it is the expectation that gender will be binary <clears throat> that precedes the discovery or assignment of biological sex and with which the biogenetics of sex are aligned even when they're not binary. However, subsequent research on sex determination has focused more on the uncertainties related to the relationship between gene action and somatic decisions or what is known as cellular differentiation or fate. Um, so early in the 20th century, the reigning axiom of the relationship between gene action and cell fate or cell type um, was known as the Weissman barrier. Um, and according to this model, which persisted well into the mid century and still to some extent shapes both biological and eth ethical positions related to human fertilization and embryology today, according to this model, the germ cells can go on to become new germ cells only via a strict separation between these cells and all the other cells in the body, a principle known as the continuity of the germplasm and also as the separation of the germline from soma. Um, and in this model, um, the germline soma model, um, DNA is continuous. The germplasm is in a sense, both pure and supreme inhabiting in effect a different spatial and temporal register than the rest of the body through which it passes. So um, in the mid 20th century, roughly around the same time, the concept of gender began to be used separately from sex. And also right around the same time, the structure of the double helix was confirmed here at Cambridge. A number of challenges to the germline soma barrier began to be introduced, including by the scientist Anne McLaren. McLaren had worked closely with Conrad Hal Waddington, who also trained at Cambridge, um, who developed the concept of epigenesis in the 1950s, proposing in 1957 that genes can take a range of environmental pathways um, according to influences around them. They can take a range of developmental pathways according to their to influences from their environment. Um, a principle he illustrated using an analogy to a pinball machine or a, or a ball rolling down a hill, which is shown here and is known as the epigenetic landscape. Somewhat earlier in the 1940s, the plant scientist Barbara McClintock had made an equally radical proposal concerning what she called controlling elements or transposons um, for, for which discovery she was much later, much later awarded the Nobel prize in 1983. McClintock's meticulous research on the reproductive cycles of maize and in particular, the mutation patterns that are legible from careful study of individual maize kernels across several generations enabled her to confirm that gene expression in plants is regulated in the same way it is in bacteria. Um, and this process is now known as the epigenetic control of genomic organization. This is the process whereby the germline is in effect told what to do. So in these models, both the temporality and spatiality of DNA are interactive and overlapping with their wider milieu. Rather than being either purely internally driven or continuous, the germline is, is, is um, unpredictable and interactive, or we might even say tentacular. The 1980s were of course a fascinating period um, for the social organization of gender as well as genes. And one way to describe the latter part of the 20th century is as a steady disarticulation of both genes and gender, as well as the relationship of both of these um, to sex, sexuality, and reproduction. Arguably today, the relationship between gene expression and gender expression um, 
is interestingly similar. Both have been steadily decoupled from biogenetic determination in no small part because that expression itself has been superseded by a literal reconstruction of the biological. And I just want to mention <laughs> that Anne McLaren was on Google two days ago, which was very cute. Um, she was the doodle. So, so this brings us to an interesting set of parallels. And going back to Anne McLaren, she was among the very first scientists to use two important tools to research in greater depth the exact mechanisms connecting reproduction and heredity. The first of these, which she used in the 1950s, was in vitro fertilization. Working with mice, McLaren was able to definitively demonstrate the formative influence of somatic cells on the germline, a process she explored further using the technique of generating mammalian chimeric organisms in vitro. That would be organisms of a parentage that wouldn't be possible to produce through unassisted reproduction. Um, as a result, McLaren was among many developmental biologists in the mid 20th century who upended the axiomatic governing principles, um, former principles governing biological determination, for example, both genetic determination and sex determination, but also introduced what I, called what I call transbiology, namely a new defining interplay between biology in vivo, in the body, un un unaltered as it were, and in vitro in an experimental context. In the context of a handmade embryo or chimera, both inheritance and development have been reworked, redefined and remade. The trans in transbiology refers to the ability to move basic biological elements around to redesign them, either in order to replicate what would have happened naturally as a model um, or as a means of making it do something else that it wouldn't have done if you hadn't assisted it. So Dolly the sheep is the first mammal born of a process that involved not only somatic cell nuclear transfer via in vitro fertilization and microinjection, but also transgenesis. The ability to recode an embryo, for example, to put a human gene into a sheep. So she didn't have human genes in her, but the technique used to make her was designed to put human genes in sheep. Um, so this brings us back um, to time inheritance, kinship, and queer DNA in what is perhaps a fittingly circuitous way. Because it suggests that many of the conceptual orientations that have shaped ideas about inheritance and families, for example, that the roots of the latter are in the biological rules of the former, are now more explicitly artificial, situational, and varied. Um, the plurality of forms of gender expression that now inform queer family structures, gay marriage, trans paternity, detransitional identities, queer parenting, um, mean that having or being a biological relative is now an increasingly explicitly relative and contingent position. Um, it is as a result now biological contingency that serves as the ground or foundational condition for determining the function of DNA in either strictly biological or social terms. Which brings us to today and here and now, and the question of what the reconstitution of the biological as a more contingent position means for both the organization of social life and the ways in which social practices are conceptualized. Over the course of the 20th century itself, so profoundly shaped by the modern eugenics movement and the racial categories that facilitated the rise of the bureaucratically biologized contemporary nation state, um, there has been a simultaneous unraveling of both gender and genetics, both socially and in the realm of professional biology. At the very same time, the central dogma of molecular genetics was being used to reinforce many of the Darwinian and Galtonian models of inheritance mid-century, a simultaneous and arguably queer counter movement to recontextualize the gene as a receptor, a follower, and what Sara Ahmed would call a willful wanderer was taking place. This process of undoing genes was accompanied by a lengthy devolution of gender, at first away from sex and biology and later from both inheritance and reproduction, um, as well as the categories male and female and the traditional nuclear family. So today, 
the question of the physical inheritance. So today, the question of physical inheritance has been indisputably cleared. This question can no longer be posed in terms of what Malinowski famously described as physical versus social facts. That binarism has completely lost its cogency. Like gender and reproduction, kinship too has become, to use Cray Hayden's distinction, more kinetic than genetic. It is formed out of an amalgam of the chosen and the acquired, the built and the born. Um, the, the, this amalgam is the new norm. The Facts of Life is now better known as a TV show that explores exactly these themes. To be sure, blood, genes, and physical inheritance are still used to denote family connection. Um, and they are still primary, primarily idioms of a realm of kinship defined by David Schneider um, as diffuse, enduring solidarity. But the literalism of these ties has been heavily diluted, superseded, and diffused. DNA is now as often used in car advertising as in discussions of family lineage. Um, Susan Go as Susan Gollenbach argues in her important recent book on what makes a family, it is not only clear that greater acceptance of a wider range of family forms is now expected, um, but that it is the children of such families that are among the most powerful spokespeople for their integrity and value. In the same way we speak of pets resembling their owners, yes, um, we, um, um, we can now expect a far greater variety of family forms based on a foundation of living together and caring for each other over time. So looking back to um, where we um, started this week, I'm ending now, looking back to where we started this week, we might also want to consider what kinds of enduring solidarities arise from shared, our shared institutional life. I would like to end by suggesting that Waithira Sabatandira was quite right to argue alongside her powerful articulate panelists on Tuesday that one of the most important legacies of living within institutions that are not designed to nurture, support, or even tolerate the people in them are the bonds that are created to survive them. For many queer people, the situation Audre Lorde has described as living in doorways on the edges of institutions, never quite part of them, aware of being out of place, is also a kind of DNA, a queer genealogy forged out of not belonging to one thing that creates the possibilities for belonging to another. So thank you to everyone who has been part of our queer gathering, our wonderful queer gathering this week. I hope soon we'll be able to meet in person. And in the meantime, don't forget to come to the after party. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Um, am I unmuted? Am I unmuted, Sarah? Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, sorry. I'm muted. I'm not muted. Yeah, no, no. I think I'm... <laughs> it's about to, uh, I think it's about to, to give everybody the, the 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 power to unmute themselves now. So if you do have any questions, then by all means, um, ask them now. I'm going to start with a question actually. While everybody, I, I see we, we've got one in the 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 chat, but I'm just going to ask um, Natasha and Juliana. Um, I think one of the things that we've been discussing quite a lot this week and has been mentioned in, in, in lots of times but never really kind of confronted is, is Munoz and, and this kind of, um, you know, Munoz's idea of, of queerness as an ideality, as a, as a, as a kind of forward, um, forward thinking, but also forward future oriented um, idea that's located on the horizon. And I think something that came across really, really um, strongly on, on, on Tuesday, in Tuesday's panel on querying, um, querying institutions was this idea that that actually that's all very well and good, but but actually thinking about the materiality, the material realities of, of queerness in the present, and particularly the intersectional realities of queerness in the present, um, can very often be can be overlooked when we think about queerness in that way. Um, and certainly Munoz doesn't overlook that, but I think some sometimes the way his work has been used. Um, overlooks that. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how those, those Munozian ideas of utopia, of the horizon, of queerness being located in the future, um, intersect with some of the, the ideas about queerness you've, you were talking about today, particularly the kind of the, the presentness, the, the present realities of, of queerness in Orjusika or um, Indiana. <clears throat> Should I start? 
Okay. So, um, thank you for that. Um, when you were talking about how, I guess, you know, boring news you know, for certain projects have come up and I've have seen, I can straight up to my mind, it came up how, you know, we, we use so much of um, the project of futurity as sort of this very whitened project, right? We think about um, cosmo cosmopolitan um, gain as a sort of this, um, the future of queerness. Um, so when you're talking about that in thinking with um, Ochisika, that's a little bit how I relate um, these, I guess, readings of Munoz, um, who's very much concerned with the present or was very much concerned with the present and finding what is wrong in the present. Um, and I feel that when when I think about Ochisika, at least, I think that that's the pull that a lot of people have had with, you know, reading his work and absor absorbing that because a huge part of his work has not, has met a lot of resistance to be read in queer um, ways as if the queerness was given because he was in Europe, because he was in touch with Londoners, with Americans. So I think that thinking about Munoz in that way, obviously it's very prejudicial as we think about, um, I guess we resettle, um, queer experiences from the global South as pre-modern or sometimes as too modern as well. Something that shows up a lot in our context, um, especially with um, queer indigenous groups. Um, how come do they, they have a cell phone and they perform that? That's too white um, for them. So that's how I read um, these interpretations of, of the future. Um, when people get sometimes too excited about the future and queerness together um, without paying a lot of attention to the very material realities of queerness in the present. Um, yeah, in Brazil, there um, in 2017, um, Berenice Bento proposed transviado as a term because queer or queer did not even capture as much um, to the feeling that perhaps can translate to Portuguese, um, this neighboring language to, to Spanish in the Americas. And transviado captures um, sort of this movement you know, outside of the lines as well as um, trans and viado fag as identities of an identity play of some sort. Um, so yeah, I guess that's um, a term that I quite enjoy thinking about and um, theorizing a little bit, um, thinking that we can step out of the line, but it's still there. We can go back to it. It's just playing with this line in, in, in a way. So that's how I kind of approach it a little bit and how I approach my dissertation as well. Okay, any more questions from audience participants? You should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, yes. Um, <clears throat> so sorry, I was sort of taken aback when you asked me for my um, own opinion on this. Um, but yeah, I was sort of thinking about sort of how coloniality a la like, when I think of like, um, like assemblages of like homonationalism and gay imperialism, all these kinds of things where we sort of, um, <clears throat> when we think of like the primacy of queerness in a lot of like imperialist narratives, how like there's sort of a forced linearity where like queer is the future in the global north um, and heterosexuality is the past in the global south. I was just thinking about that um, and sort of how that kind of linearity is colonized, but at the same time that, I don't know, it was just really confu um, not super, not confusing, I don't think that's the right word, but like it's really com complicated, I guess, um, when you brought up that perhaps ignoring linearity might not necessarily be fruitful or productive when it comes to like conversations about anti-colonialism or anti-racism. Um, but yeah, I can sort of see how like um, both the acceptance and rejection of linearity is kind of ambivalent. I don't know if that's correct, is that the right word to describe it, but I can sort of see how it can be co-opted in different ways. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, yes, hello. I was trying to type a question and then I was like, this is chaotic, I'll just try and um, put it into words. But thank you all so much for your papers. I was wondering if um, all three of the panelists maybe had thoughts on survival as a temporality. It felt like a concept that kind of drew all three together. 
um, in various ways. I've, I've been really um, struck by your use of the word scrambled, Natasha, because it really evokes for me the kind of queer scrambling, like reactive, chaotic scrambling to find a solution in those moments of kind of organizing and mutual aid um, where you were scrambling around in a really chaotic way to try and to try and survive. Um, so I, I was just thinking about the temporalities of survival and, and whether that evoked anything interesting for any of you. Sarah, would you like to start with that one while we give Natasha time to catch her breath? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, Najee, that's a great question. That's a really, really good question. And it does take us right back over the course of the week as well um, as across these papers today. Um, and it, yeah, it takes us very much, I think, to the heart of the question of temporality and the multiplicity of temporality, because I think um, one of the kind of curious things about linear time, um, which, which is often represented as a kind of dominant or hegemonic time, and yes, you know, as a kind of straight or normative time, um, is that it's often, as it were, co-inhabited by other kinds of time. Um, and indeed um, by timing, um, which is such a massively queer <laughs> type of causality. Um, and, um, and timing and scrambling have that in common. I think that, um, that, that um, timing in and of itself can be so causal for reasons that are often not at all intentional and vice versa. Um, intention can often manifest as a failure because of, of mistiming. Unfortunately, I think we probably all know that um, from, from many disappointments. And um, that what that would mean would be that survival would require a kind of conscious ability to, to, to time switch, as it were. Um, and maybe um, that's a little bit of the theme of what Natasha was describing um, in the tentacular scene of doing the puzzle and watching television and kind of being there in several different ways because in effect survival at one level is about reaction and is about um, being able to move and being able to to shift and being able to um, adapt by perhaps evacuating one temporal register and entering another or um, keeping several going at the same time so that you don't get stuck in, in one of them. I don't know if that's a helpful response, but that's what comes to my mind off the top of my head. Juliana? Yeah, that was um, very interesting to think about survival. Um, the first thing that came up to my mind was just thinking, I guess, surviving as sometimes can be a realization that something there's just not enough right now it's just not enough and kind of sometimes even if we don't want to my forces to kind of look for alternative routes um but it came to my mind a lot actually um discussions that i'm part of here in brazil um you know with bolsonaro being this absolutely um living us in a very dire situation um and a lot of the talks that I keep seeing and people repeating is that we just have to survive now. And then he will just, you know, we'll find another government, Lula will come back to us and everything will be fine. They survived, we'll survive again. And it's just, it's a little unsettling to feel that because if we look at the communities, the Brazilian queer racialized communities all throughout these years, there, there was no much of, you know, stopping, and they never stopped to survive. They never stopped to sort of endure this time, um, even if things might have um, improved in different ways. So it's just, I, I think it was interesting how it just incited very angry feelings on me to think about survival in this way, as you talked about it, just, you know, let's just get over with it. I'm, it might be a little bit more complicated than that, but I don't have a full, a full answer to you. I'm, I'm conscious of the time that we're just slightly over. So um, I think what we should do now is say an absolute huge thank you to our three uh, panelists. I'm, I'm sure you can just have to imagine the, the rapturous applause that you, that you would have received if we were in person. Um, but if we want to take a couple of minutes break now, uh, switch off cameras, switch off the microphones, grab a 
cup of tea or a glass of wine, whatever, whatever um, you feel like. And we'll come back here, right, Sarah, for the after party? Yeah. So thanks everyone for coming and I hope to see uh, quite a few of you in a couple of minutes time at the party.